If you've been following the news the last few days, you should have noticed that there have been some pretty serious problems reported with the way Apple does SSL. If you are running OS X or iOS on any of your devices, you should try connecting to the URL to see if you have this code running or not. The Apple bug is quite instructive and interesting and something that it looks like most of you probably are running machines that are vulnerable to. When you open a site with HTTPS that's using TLS, or SSL, they're really the same protocol, it just changed names, to verify the endpoint of that site. And you can see that Safari thinks this is secure, it's giving me the lock. If I click on the lock, it will tell me I have an encrypted connection, and I can see the certificate, and it looks perfectly happy with that. Unfortunately, the, the site that I'm connecting to actually has an invalid certificate. This is a pretty serious bug. If you connected using Chrome or Firefox, you should have seen a message like this. So how many people have buggy SSL implementations? So it looks like at least a quarter or so of you. Let me explain a little more what's going on with SSL. So you're connecting to a web server. There's a protocol that's used to establish secure connection. So anytime you're doing things on the web that are using credentials, using personal information, credit cards, using anything that you don't want anyone on the network to see, you should end up using SSL and the sites if you connect using HTTPS, this is the protocol that's running. What happens when the client says hello is the server will send back a certificate that is intended to prove to the client that this is really the server that we're talking to. So the server identity in there with the name that matches the site that I'm visiting. The browser should check that. For it to be a valid certificate, it's signed by some certificate authority that your browser trusts. I think most of you hopefully have seen public key crypto somewhere else. I'm not going to explain it today. The only important thing you have to understand about public key crypto for this is that you can use encryption and decryption with different keys. And this enables you to do signatures where you're signing with one key and checking the signature with the other and you're keeping the signing key secret. And in this case, this is the signing key. It's the key of the certificate authority that generated the certificate for the site you're visiting. And that's a secret. The client, after receiving this, will verify that it's a valid certificate. Check that the identity matches what it should match. Check that the certificate was signed by the certificate authority that's trusted. And it can do that using the corresponding public key. What the browser will do is generate some random session key. The main reason for this is public key cryptography is really slow. Symmetric key is comparatively very fast. So you don't want to have all your messages encrypted with these public keys. You want to generate a new session key that you're going to use for all the server client communication after that. So the client will generate some random key, send it back to the server, encrypted with the public key that came in the certificate. And that means that only the server that knows the corresponding private key should be able to decrypt that message, extract the session key from it, and then once they've done that, all the messages between the client and the server can be encrypted using that secret key. Does this make sense? You can convince me that it makes sense by explaining how the client gets this public key that it's using to check the certificate. An important part of this is the client knowing this key that is the key that you need to check the certificate that is the public key of the certificate authority. So how did you get that public key? Yeah, good, yeah. So the way you got that, probably in almost all cases that you're doing, unless you explicitly did something to get it, it was built into your browser. You trusted your browser vendor or wherever you got your browser or however you downloaded it to only put certificate keys from trusted certificate authorities in there. And you can look in your browser at the list of all the certificate keys you have. It will probably frighten you how long that list is. Maybe we trust a lot, they're pretty well known. I don't know if you trust GoDaddy, if you trust Turkey. All these are what's built into the default download of Chrome. You can look at your certificates to figure out all the people that you're trusting. Assuming that that list is maintained carefully and your browser download or install wasn't compromised, all the trust you have is in these certificate authorities, and then every site you visit, you're verifying that it's really the site that you're visiting based on a certificate signed by one of them. An important part of that process is that your client actually has to check it. If your client doesn't check the certificate's valid, there's really no point to all of this. Any site can impersonate any other site. The point of this protocol is to make it so if someone's intercepting your traffic, they can't pretend to be the site you're trying to visit unless they've also broken into these keys or found a <coughs> compromised certificate authority. Let's look at Apple's code. So this is the code from Apple's implementation of SSL, and it's verifying 
the key exchange, so it's verifying the certificate to figure out if this server is what it purports to be and is sending a valid certificate. Before we get to the actual buggy code, so this doesn't have the, the bug in it yet. How do we like this code in general? If someone turned this in and say, like, CS 1110, and you had to grade it, what would you think of it? Yeah. There's no for, okay, good. Yeah, so it's not formatted logically. We have things not lined up. We have weird spacing. That's pretty bad. Are there any other things you don't like about this code if you were, say, grading it maybe in 2110 instead of 1110? Okay, so there are no comments. What would we really like to have rather than just comments in code like this, especially important security code? Comments sometimes do hurt, by the way. So, so it's, it's a good point that, yes, you would certainly like any code like this, especially when we've got you know, long, complicated parameter lists. We would like something explaining the preconditions, the postconditions, something to, to document what this function is supposed to do. The, the place where comments really hurt is when they're not correct when they don't match the code. In some sense, no comments is better than having bad comments. What would we prefer to have more than comments? Defensive programming is all about, let's try to program in such a way that if we get a bad input or if we make a mistake, the damage is gonna be limited. We're gonna discover something bad. The most standard way to, to do that, or, or one very specific thing to do about that, is to have assertions. We should have a bunch of assertions that check that all the things that we're assuming about the inputs are actually true. In a language like C, almost everything really needs assertion because the type checking is very limited, everything else is very limited. If you have a stronger language, you would prefer to have more things statically checked. If the assertions happen at runtime, if they fail, you're gonna get a runtime error, whereas type checking and all the uh, memory sharing checking and all the other things that Rust is doing, well, that happens at comp compile time, that's even better. But if you can't get things checked at compile time, you definitely would like to have lots of assertions at runtime. We don't like this code too much. There's not a single assertion in this whole function that I'll show you the rest of now. Here is the part of it that matters as far as the bug. I have cleaned it up, so this was also indented and formatted much worse than it appears now, but I haven't removed the bug. So the way to check a signature, the way signatures work, is you compute a hash of a bunch of things. That hash gets signed, and then you check by computing the same hash if it equals the signature. And the reason you're doing all the hashes is you don't want to have to sign a really big thing. You want to sign something small. And what cryptographic hashes do is give you a way mapping any amount of data to a small fixed length of data that is hard to find other things that map to the same short. So there certainly are other things that would map to the same hash value because it's shorter than the full data. But cryptographic hashes are designed to make it so you believe that it's very difficult to find something. To check the signature, what we have to do is compute the same hash. We're computing a hash. All these SSL hash SHA-1 update are adding more message data into the hash. At the end of computing all those, we're verifying all the things that need to be correct, checking that they match what they're supposed to match. What do we really not like about this code? Good. So we've got two go-to fails. One of the points that was brought up on the earlier code is not having brackets around our if bodies. Well, if we did have brackets, it's just one statement there. What does this code actually do with the second go-to fail? It always goes to go-to fail. This go-to fail really should be indented out here. We always jump to that fail. This code that's supposed to be checking the SSL signature, what it's actually doing is starting to compute this hash. As long as it gets through these three parts of the hash, it goes to fail, it deallocates these buffers, and then it returns error. ERR is the return value, which is of this OS status type that is the result of the signature checking. So the value of error is either probably either zero or some positive number, maybe, maybe one. Right. So if it returns a non-zero value, that means there was an error, and the code that called it is supposed to do something like pop up that error message that we saw in Firefox and Chrome. What's the value of error gonna be as long as we don't have any failures here? Well, the error value gets assigned from this update, which didn't fail. So it's gonna be zero. And then we're gonna go to fail, free all these, and return zero, and it's gonna be okay. Certificate never gets checked. And the code that's supposed to check it always returns everything's okay and the browser keeps going happily, displaying that we're on a secure page with a good certificate, 
even though the certificate was never checked. So this is a pretty, pretty serious problem. So this is obviously a you know, stupid mistake having the two go-to fails. Like that's the most obvious symptom of the problem. What are all the things that should have prevented this from actually getting into production code that is running on millions of machines? It's just the kind of mistake that you know, a programmer had a bad day and we should accept this kind of thing happening. Or it's obviously an NSA backdoor because no programmer could be that stupid. Okay, good. So we should probably be testing code. The fact that this got through suggests they don't have any part of their release process that actually tests that it detects a bad certificate. Because any bad certificate would end up failing. So certainly testing is really important. Testing really should be part of a release process. If testing is something that you do manually when you feel like it, then maybe stuff like this can still get through. Certainly any serious software should have as part of its build, and you're starting to use make files, you would like to have make test something as part of the build and certainly something as part of the release cycle that would never let something that is this obviously broken ever get released into our product. Should this kind of problem have been detected even before we had to actually run the code and run through these tests? Code review, okay. So code review maybe would help. Certainly if smart people looked at the right lines of code and companies that take security more seriously than Apple, any code that's on any critical path for security, there's a special team that does review it. This is what companies like Microsoft do that have a team that is expert in crypto and to detect the hard mistakes in crypto really is hard. Things like if there's a side channel leak or you're not using padding for a cipher in the correct way, those are hard things to detect that testing is not going to figure out and probably a typical code review wouldn't. This kind of bug, yeah, any sensible code review, if they actually looked at this, would have noticed it. And many open source projects do have fairly extensive code review expectations before any new code gets pulled into the project that someone who's an expert also has to look at it and make sure it seems sensible. So it seems like that was not happening at, at Apple. Code review is definitely, it's still a human process. And if the code is this ugly, there's a good chance that the reviewer would not have got this far to notice this problem unless they were really well motivated to look at all the code. At least in this case, what should have prevented the problem before it even got to a code review or a test? Coding, okay. So coding conventions, good coding style would have made this much less likely to happen. That's worth adding to the list. Not the, the one that I think is, is actually the, the strongest defense against this kind of, this particular problem that should have been done at Apple, but unless it is an NSA backdoor, which it seems unlikely, because if the NSA wanted to hide the backdoor, they would have hidden it a lot better than this. They're much smarter than that. What should have detected this problem? It didn't require a human code review. It didn't require testing. Yes. Yeah, the compiler should be able to detect this. The reason the compiler should be able to detect it, well, all of this code is unreachable. If there's a bunch of code in your program that the compiler can determine will never be reached, that seems like something that the programmer probably made a mistake and should get some kind of warning. We want to get unreachable code warnings. Patrick Walton is mentioning that this is actually on by default in Rust to get unreachable code warnings. We should pause for a second, though, and question whether this actually makes sense. So can we get unreachable code warnings from our compiler? So if you try to write code like this in Rust, and it's pretty hard to do, but you could write code that is analogous, you would get an unreachable code warning. Do we think a compiler should be able to do this? How hard is it to generate unreachable code warnings? So what's our definition of unreachable code? Yeah, code that no execution of the program will ever execute. So do we think a compiler should be able to detect unreachable code? Let's see. So who's taking the theory class? Is taking now or has taken in the past? If you're taking a theory class or, or have taken a theory class, this should start to ring alarm bells. Um, if you've taken good early classes, it should also start to ring alarm bells. How hard do we think it is to detect unreachable code? It's kind of like the halting problem. OK, yes. It's exactly like the halting pro problem. Right. So to do this precisely would require solving an impossible problem. It's not just hard. It's impossible. So the halting problem is known to be impossible. 
that you can't have any decision procedure that takes a program as input and tells you yes or no whether that program always finishes. The intuition behind this is, well, you can't just simulate the program because you don't know how long to wait. But if you tried simulating it, you could wait some amount of time. If it has finished by then, you say, well, we know it's going to finish because it finished. But if it hasn't finished, you don't know if you need to wait longer or it's never going to finish. And there's a very interesting proof that I hope you see in the theory class or, or earlier that shows the, the logical contradiction that you get if you had a program that could decide if another program would halt and get the answer right all the time. If we had unreachable code detection, then we could actually build halts. We could write a program that would detect if another program halts by just checking is the line after that other program reachable or not. If this halts, then it's reachable. If it doesn't halt, it's not reachable. That means it's impossible. It's logically impossible to, to always answer this correctly. But compilers shouldn't be constrained by theory, which is kind of a strange thing to say. Certainly, the theory is true. So how do we get around this in a compiler? We've just proven that it is logically impossible to correctly detect unreachable code. What do we want our compiler to do instead? OK, good. Yeah. So. We want it to do the best it can. Then we have to decide, well, do we prefer that it errors on the side of sometimes saying code is unreachable when it's actually reachable, or sometimes saying code is reachable when it's not? Did I say both case? I think I might have said the same case twice. Right? So we either have to give false warnings and say, this code is unreachable, but it might actually be reachable. Or we have to miss warnings, where we have code that is actually unreachable, but we don't give a warning for it. Which one of these two options makes the most sense? OK, good. So why is that option better? Why is it better to miss some unreachable code than to guarantee that you always report code as unreachable, but sometimes report reachable code as unreachable? We took the approach of saying we're going to be really strict, and we're not going to let any program compile that the compiler can't prove all of the lines in that program are reachable, which is certainly what the approach Rust takes for many kinds of things the compiler does. Right? So it won't let you compile a program that it cannot prove as type safe. If you've got anything that might be a type error in your program and the compiler can't correctly infer that it's type safe, it will not let you compile that. Right? And we saw that a couple classes ago with the borrowed parameter and return types, that the Rust compiler is not able to infer types correctly for that. Even though it was a well-typed program, we just needed to provide extra annotations to help the compiler. So in terms of type checking, it's very strict. If it can't prove that it's OK, it won't let you compile it. Do we want that level of strictness for reachability? I do have a prize for the answer to this question. Actually, I have a prize for a bad answer, too. OK, yes. Yeah, so, so it's, it's actually a tough trade-off. Right? And the problem with reachability is if you tried to do this soundly, you would have to disallow almost all code. You'd have to disallow any code that has any kind of constructs in it that you can't guarantee finish. Right? So any loop in a program, if you can't guarantee that loop's going to finish, well, then you've got to give a warning that the line after it might be unreachable. And at least in the, the current state of analysis, it's very hard to prove that loops finish and that, to prove that recursive calls terminate. So you have to be, in this sense, I would say liberal, and allow code that you can't prove does not have anything unreachable. But you can certainly be useful. A mistake like this one, where it's obviously unreachable, a compiler should be able to warn you. C compilers actually do warn you about this if you set the right flags. But Apple apparently was not setting the right flags to get this warning. OK, and I do have a prize. This course doesn't have a lot of theory in it, but I don't want to give the impression that theory is not important. So I have written a theory of computation book. It's not quite suitable for the intro theory course here, because its, it's target audi audience is sort of two and three year olds. But it does have some theory concepts that if you understood them better, you would have been able to answer my questions today better than you did. I do have a prize for you. That is your, your new theory of computation textbook. I, I do know people have failed their PhD qualifiers for not understanding everything that's in this book. <laughs>